Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you again for stopping by. Just to mention, I'll be off tomorrow. It's rather exciting. I'm off to South Africa to drive some very fast cars around the Kailani racetrack. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, just to mention that uh, we've up now uploaded the interview I did after my speak with the Secretary General, Dr. Richard Sassibera. We're in the process of. Uh, uh, uploading the actual MindSpeak presentation, which was uh, so interesting as well. Um, and uh, two TwitPics I'm going to put up. One, when Dr. Ceci Barra says, says, there is no better place than I can think of being than at MindSpeak. And I thought that was a very sweet comment. And he also said, you know, our countries are the fastest growing countries uh, in the world, or well, second fastest after emerging ASEAN. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and that's before the oil and gas, and I think that's uh, an interesting point worth taking on board as well. Um, it was a pleasure meeting the Deloitte Africa CEO, uh, Liwazi Bam, yesterday at the Deloitte offices. Um, very interesting and engaging individual, I must admit, looking forward to con connecting with him again. Um, of course, Deloitte uh, were my guests at Might Speak at Christmas uh, last year. I'll put up the link for that. And uh, Sammy, Nikhil, Martin Oduor, Anne Mariah, and Harveen Gadoka were extremely interesting and insightful about uh, their business and the world as they found them. And there's so many stories. Nikhil, of course, turned out to be a marvelous comedian. Um, and I always tease him that uh, that was his opportunity to inflect his career. And, divert into uh, comedy, which is now quite a well-paying profession. And uh, there's also a link for the post uh, Mind Speak interview with the same people. Um, I'll still go back to Don DeLillo, everything is barely weeks, everything is days, we have minutes to live. And certainly the 21st century is a world hurtling at a dizzying velocity. Home Thoughts turned to the Savo in a wonderful piece I found by a fellow called Mark Diebel talking about the last of the great Tuskers. Ever since we started filming in Savo, we'd look for a big Tusker, but they are elusive. It's the reason they are still alive. They are also very rare. They are bulls with tusks so large that they can rest them on the ground. They are probably only a dozen of the fab fabled 100 plus pounders left in Savo's 16,000 square miles. And I'll put up some photographs uh, that I took over Christmas from the Savo, elephants crossing the Galana River on Christmas Day, happy Christmas from the Savo. This is a photograph taken at sunset as I walk down the Lugard Falls, uh, the railway crossing at Manyani Gate, which is as you enter, I entered via the Manyani Gate, and a scene of wild white flowers um, that I found in the park as well. Uh, returning to uh, Mark Diebel, Kruger used to have its magnificent seven, but no longer. Savo's collection of great tuskers is now the last in the world. They should be national treasures, cherished by Kenyans and protected by presidential decree, but they are not. After two years of filming around Savo, we heard of one of the fabled bulls. He was living on a community ranch notorious for its gangs of armed Somalis that poach elephants. According to our source, the huge bull hid in very thick bush during the day, only emerging to feed when it was dark. Much as we wanted to film a true tusker, we felt we couldn't risk searching for him. We'd only draw attention to the area he hid in, and that would put him in danger. There was no alternative but to wait. Seasons passed without sightings. I was about to do that one day and took a last look out of the filming window when I glimpsed something through the heat haze. Initially, I thought the sun had reflected off the windscreen of a distant vehicle, but there were no tracks close by. Whatever it was disappeared, then glinted once more. Alert now, it was several minutes before I saw it again. I came to the slow realization that what I was looking at was sunlight reflecting off an elephant's tusks. 
Gradually, like in the opening scene from Lawrence of Arabia, their owner materialized through the shimmering haze, a mirage from the Taru Desert, a magnificent, dusty behemoth. Other elephants stood sleeping, clustered in the shade of acacias, apparently unaware of the bull's approach. He didn't walk straight to water. It took him almost an hour to cover the final kilometer as he slowly zigzagged from one bush to another. The glint I'd seen came whenever he turned his head and appeared to bury it in a bush. Each time he did, he'd wait a few minutes, partially hidden, then continue zigzagging upwind, scenting the air to check there wasn't a poacher hidden at the water hole. I was mystified at the bull's poor attempt to hide until it dawned on me that he wasn't trying to hide his body, he was hiding his tusks. At once I was incredibly impressed and incredibly sad, impressed that he should have the understanding that his tusks could put him in danger, but so sad at what that meant. As he neared the waterhole, other elephants left the shade to gather round and greet him. He was a magnificent bull, unmarked, apart from a diagonal scar on his trunk. He had the largest tusks I'd ever seen. I've shown pictures of him to others, and his tusks are of such a size and sweep that even elephant experts of 40 years standing have had an audible intake of breath. We saw him a number of times after that. Initially, I wondered if my interpretation of his behaviour was fanciful, just a filmmaker's frustration at not being able to get a clear view. But whenever we saw him, he tried to hide his tusks, and I am convinced it was deliberate. I was thankful that the bull's wounds were healing and that we hadn't had to dart him. But I was devastated that poachers had somehow managed to predict his movements and get close enough to fire two poison arrows into him. I was appalled at what that means, that the survival skills that the bull has painstakingly learnt over half a century have been rendered useless by the poacher's use of mass-produced Chinese goods, GPS smartphones, cheap motorcycles and night vision goggles. I think the old bull knows that poachers want his tusks, and I hate that he knows. More than anything, I hate the thought that poachers are now closing in on one of the world's most iconic elephants. For over half a century, the vast expanse of the Taru Desert has provided him with refuge, but it no longer seems vast enough. I love elephants, and there is this documentary. If you get a chance, just type it into YouTube, Elephants Documentary, Mount Kilimanjaro. And it's very powerful. <coughs> and I, for one, adore just getting into the Sava and wandering around as we did over Christmas um, when we saw the elephants crossing the Galana River um, on Christmas Day. I wandered around the Lugard Falls on foot, of course, with this incredible fellow who must have been about 85 years old, but was as fit as a fiddle, and far fitter than me. And he was obviously one of the indigenous people from that part, and the KWS had hired him. Very interesting man, um, difficult to keep up with, uh, especially wandering up after we'd gone down those Lugard Falls. I'll put up a photograph again of the railway crossing at Manyani Gate, and those wild white flowers that I saw on the roadside. Um, at, at that time. Moving on, political reflections, and thank you for indulging my passion for those few minutes. Sudan has announced that the President of South Sudan, Mr. Salva Kiir, Maya Ditt, will visit Khartoum on Saturday to hold a summit with his Sudanese counterpart, Omar al-Bashir. Sudanese Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesman Abu Bakr al siddiq told the nation that the one-day visit comes in response to an invitation from al-Bashir the visit comes within the context of continued interplay between the two countries to further develop their relations, Mr. al Siddiq said. And my conclusions are that they are bedfellows now, aren't they? However, they were not on the 30th of January when they were slugging it out, and I wrote this piece, Sudan's, South Sudan's oil cut-off, 
brilliant negotiating or suicide. Then there was a current stand, there was a standoff between Sudan and the newly independent South Sudan, which made me recall an anecdote told by Henry Kissinger after a series of negotiations with the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad, the late President Hafez al-Assad. Assad never lost his aplomb. He negotiated daringly and tenaciously like a riverboat gambler to make sure he exacted the last sliver of available concessions. I once told him that I had seen negotiators who deliber deliberately moved themselves to the edge of a precipice to show that they had no further margin of manoeuvre. I had even known negotiators who put one foot over the edge, in effect threatening their own suicide. He was the only one who would actually jump off the precipice, hoping that on his way down he could break his fall by grabbing a tree he knew to be there. And I said in that article in 2012, January, I will leave it to you to calculate who might be Hafez and who might be, whether it was Salva Kiir or Omar al-Bashir. And I go back, you know, he's saying I'd even know negotiators who put one foot over the edge in effect threatening their own suicide. At that time, that's what they were doing. I think each side felt the other was one punch away from being knocked out, knocked out for good. And subsequently, I think they realized they were both so close to being knocked out that they're not keen on repeating it. I'll put up a photograph of South Sudan's President Kiir and, uh, South Sud and Sudan's President Omar al-Bashir from Juba Airport, July 9, 2011. Um, and I came across this at the EU-Africa Summit. Total EU-Africa trade exports plus imports increased by 44.8% between 2007 and 2012. President Kagame's people, who are wonderful social media exponents, tweeted a photograph of him, which I'll put up in Brussels with Louise Mishikiwabo. And I'll also put in a link with him uh, from his mind speak in 2011. The euro 137.64 has weakened about 0.8% versus the dollar since Mario Draghi said on March 13 the exchange rate is increasingly relevant in our assessment of price stability. I think the move lower below 138 today is because the ECB is going to make a rate decision. I don't think uh, there's going to be any change. Dollar index ticking above 80.20. Interestingly the Bloomberg spot dollar index is at a two-week high. Um, close at a two-week high. It's moving forward. Um, this is just above key resistance. We've got to keep an eye on it. If we have a strong number tomorrow, uh, employment number, I think we'll see a move higher. Um, so it does look firmer um, right now. Mostly the gain in the dollar index has been because of dollar yen. Dollar yen was little changed at 103.89, but touched 104.07, which was the highest level for the dollar against the yen since January 20. Uh, I think it's a trading bar above with a 104, 105 handle. Swiss franc 0.8871, the pound 166.40, the Aussie 0.9228, India rupee 6011 playing with that 60 uh, figure, South Korea 10.5681, Real 226.98, Brazil raised its rate for the ninth straight meeting to 11%. The Egyptian pound 697.66. And the Rand 1066.26, that's backed up off that resistance level. So you can see higher beta, a little bit marginally softer, but the big component in the dollar index's rise is the dollar yen. I'll put up a three month chart of the dollar index and you know reaffirm the fact that we're just pushing through resistance. We've got to keep an eye on it here. Euro dollar 137.64, I think a little bit nervy ahead of the ECB meeting and its announcement. Dollar yen 103.91. I'll put up a three-month chart of that. I think it's a trading buy with a 104 handle. Gold, last trading at 1291.58. I'll put up a three-month chart. As I've said uh, severally, I think the 2014 high is in for gold. Crude oil below nine, below 199.27. Uh, if you just sold it above 100, bought it below 100 all year, you'd be doing very, very well. I feel it's biased to go lower. South African all share up 5.98% this year and at record highs. Dollar Rand, I'll put up a three month chart, 1064.58, as I said, um, and unable to break through, so we're still in that range, which is 1055, 1150, but we're at the top end of it. 
uh, Egyptian pound 697.52, little bit marginally softer, but that was an interesting uh, piece of news yesterday from Reuters that they'd cleared the backlog of um, uh, foreign investors who'd sold shares but not been able to uh, take their cash out. And that, I think, is a counterintuitively a very bullish signal. The Egyptian stock market is Africa's best in 2014. It's up 17.75%. The Nigeria all shares down 5.8% in 2014. Ghana stock exchange is up 11.27%. Uh, 11.27% in, in 2014, but all that has been eroded by uh, SEDI, which has fallen sharply. The Monetary Policy Committee left the interest rate at 18% um, on uh, yesterday. Uh, they said the committee is of the view that the impulses of the recent monetary policy hike are still working through the system. One has said um, they raised the reserve requirement um, uh, they're struggling to curb inflation that's at a four-year high. The SEDI lost 20% last year of its value. It's already down 12% this year. Um, policymakers raised the amount of cash as a proportion of deposits that commercial lenders must hold in the reserve uh, by 200 basis points to 11%. Um, and I, I, for one, am not sure that that's going to be sufficient to staunch uh, the fall. Now, Ghana um, uh, is expected to slow to 4.8% GDP growth this year, from 5.5% in 2013, according to the IMF. And I wrote about this on the 24th of March, when I said the open question is whether Ghana is in the cockpit, or whether the markets will simply elbow the government aside. Um, and I was saying that, you know, the currency has been in free fall, the euro bond has a 9% handle, sentiment has soured so much. That I said then it was entirely feasible that Ghana might print a double digit yield. And saying it's a near perfect harbinger of what can go wrong when you front load your recurrent expenditure in the expectation that revenues are always going to be a rising tide. Bob Diamond plans an African loan securitization to lure investors. Securitizing loans will open up one of the fastest growing regions in the world to institutional investors and provide capital to businesses operating there, Diamond said in an interview in Johannesburg. Bank ABC, which Robert Diamond's Atlas Mara co-invest limited, agreed to purchase earlier this week, plans to sell a $115 million bond to fund its operations across southern Africa. I uh, was speaking at the East African Property Investment Summit at the Kapinski uh, this morning, and uh, rather nice actually because they put me up there as well so I quite enjoyed myself last night um, but uh, what the, the, the preceding presentation was made by a fellow called Jonathan Foster Petley it was a very interesting one as well um, and he, uh, he spoke at one point about African hotspots so I took a photograph of that so you can see where those hotspots are there are hot, hot spots, there are some black spots there are some soft spots but the hotspot story is the key one isn't it Mombasa was calm but tense on Wednesday. Many businesses shut in the city's flashpoint area of Majenga. Trucks full of armed police patrolled palm-lined streets and surrounding areas. When Rogo was shot dead in 2012, the killing caused several days of riots. The same happened when Rogo's protégé was killed in almost identical circumstances in October 2013. Muslim youths clashed with police for three days in February after a man was killed during a police raid uh, on the same mosque used by firebrand preachers in the Majengo area. Khalid, flanked by Muhuri members, said the government had three days to unravel the mystery of Makaburi's death. Failure to do so, we shall go to the streets and protest as allowed under our constitution. My conclusions are that Friday might well prove a flashpoint. I put up a photograph of Sheikh Ibrahim Omar Rogo, alias Amru, and Sheikh Abu Bakr Sharif, aka Makaburi, both dead. Well, they were alive when I took that when that photograph was taken. On that note, I'll put up a photograph of the sunset in Mombasa. Another one of uh, the fellow um, barbecuing corn, which is favourite. And finally, one of the seaside in Diani. Total Kenya reported full year results, earnings per share 
of two shillings and eight cents versus a loss of 32 cents in the previous year. Net sale, uh, sorry, gross sales up 29.082 percent. Uh, operating expenses came lower. Uh, I think that's a right back to something that they previously provisioned for, which assisted that. Uh, otherwise, I think it would have been up 5 percent. Finance costs down to 278.695 million from 1.55 billion. Profit before tax, 2.0845 billion versus a loss of 64.3 million. Profit after tax, 1.3122 billion versus a loss of 202.142 million. Previously, they hiked the dividend by 200%. Spoke of a significant reduction in financing expenses um, arising from 5.2 billion shillings injected by Total in June 2012. Sales volumes up 37 percent lower gross margin by 100 basis points attributable to OTS sales which have a lower margin that's wholesale market I think these were strong results telegraphed in the first half earnings release the dividend has been hiked 200 percent worth nearly five percent of yield share price down five percent this year as of this market's opening I think it deserves to trade higher and uh, it, these were very respectable results I think Kenya shilling trading at 86.63 last. The Nairobi all share up 5.2103% this year. The NSC 20 is up 1.9% this year. The ex Blackwater CEO and former US Navy SEAL Eric Prince has deepened his involvement with Kenya's aviation industry with the acquisition of a 49% stake in Phoenix Aviation. Though the owners of Phoenix Aviation are saying nothing has been finalized, it's still in a stage of negotiations. He refused to shed more light on the deal. Three Kenyan firms topped the list of Africa's most innovative. This is a fast company um, list named IHUB, Sun Energy, and One Acre Fund as Africa's foremost leaders in innovation. I'm not convinced of that analysis, but never mind. Uh, once again, I appreciate the fact uh, that you stopped by and listened to my musings. I'm grateful to that. And uh, I wish you an early weekend because I'll be running around a racetrack, which is my age, I should be concerned about, but, you know, looking forward to it. Thank you.